Thank you all for being here this morning. My name is Jise. I'm a senior student at the Village Zendo, and it's really lovely to see all of you. Uh, I'm here in Pauling, New York. It's very rural. Um, when I look out my window, I'm just surrounded by a forest, snow in the ground. The trees are all brown and stripped bare. And uh, I can see across the street and up the hill to a barn. Um, it's beautiful. So um, yesterday, um, Rio Tan Roshi gave a talk um, in Erzezenkai. And he began by saying that he was feeling a bit nervous, which was unusual for him. He said that he thought it was about uh, the fact that he uh, didn't have a point to make in his Dharma talk, and usually he did. Uh, his just natural, relaxed ease with which he talked about feeling nervous was so helpful for me to hear. Was, he was so real and grounded, so honest and unguarded, and that's really what I noticed. And that's our practice. And um, Rio Tan modeled that for me. So this morning, I'm experiencing some nerves, as usual, <laughs> before giving a talk. Uh, my stage fright is one of my uh, one of the earliest memories I have of being in Mrs. Shoemaker's English class in fourth grade having to recite The Lady of Shio and completely blanking in the middle of it and sitting down feeling a lot of uh, totally disgraced and a lot of shame. Um, so I've had stage fright ever since. It's gotten better. It's not as debilitating as it used to be. All of the Zendo positions and jobs that I've ever had over the last uh, however many years it's been, um, has been a way for me to practice with my fear and tightness about uh, speaking and performance. And so I really feel tremendous appreciation and gratitude for Roshi and our teachers for giving me these opportunities to work with my fear and tightness um, to make mistakes, to mess up, and, and I've survived <laughs> and, um, and, and grown. It's so counter to the way our culture is. Failure is a punishable offense. Not doing something well is criticized. The Zendo is just this wonderful incubator for new beginnings, for practicing, you know, what is hard for each of us, something different for each of us. And, you know, perhaps for healing past trauma. I feel so supported by you to practice together with what is difficult for me. It's a way through. Practice is through. It's not bypassing. So, Today is February 14th, it's Valentine's Day. I've thought a lot these past months about love and healing. It's been very moving for me to feel the love and caring for each other in our Sangha that is expressed in so many ways. So what is love? What is compassionate love? The deep, expansive love that words don't reach. This is certainly not the sentimental love that we associate Valentine's Day with. The Greeks gave it the word agape, agape, the highest love, unconditional love of God for man and man for God. God means different things 
to different people. And um, for instance, the Proud Boys, as they were marching to the Capitol on January 6th, got down on their knees and prayed to Jesus. So God means different things to different people. The Dalai Lama said, my religion is kindness, which I find hard to beat as I think about love, so simple and direct, but less conventionally, consider love through the lens of non-harming and doing good for others. How about intention is love? The intention to be present, to breathe, to ground ourselves in our ordinary lives, to move beyond our self-centered concerns to the larger life of all together, of the whole. Aspiration is love. Aspiration to love myself and others and engage in loving action. Vow is love. Our vow to be bodhisattvas. Sentient beings are numberless. I vow to save them. Desires are inexhaustible. I vow to put an end to them. The dharmas are boundless. I vow to master them. The Buddha way is unattainable. I vow to attain it. Effort is love. Our effort to show up and support, contribute to the community. Determination is love. Our determination, nine times fall down, 10 times get up. Intention, aspiration, vow, effort, determination, all these words speak to practice. How about practice is love? The way seeking mind as the way of love. Walking, sitting, lying down, 24 seven zazen. Dogen encourages us to practice, to wake up. A moment of practice is a moment of enlightenment. The teachings say, as I understand it, that Buddha nature is at our core, is our essential nature, that we all have it. Can we say Buddha nature is love? I say yes, the essence of our being, joyful, pure, eternal being. I imagine as I look back and ask the question, what drew me to Zen practice? To walk through the door at 588 Broadway years ago. I imagine that it was my longing to be my real self for relief from suffering, my longing to heal, my longing for stability. I definitely desired more love and connection in my life and relationships. My longing to move from a small self-centered life to a larger life of purpose and meaning. My true self, authentic self, Buddha nature was hidden under layers and layers of ego serving habits and conditioning. Collective beliefs that were rigid and judgmental. I experienced uh, myself as lacking. I walled myself off in stage fright silence, 
didn't want others to see the flawed and imperfect person I felt I was. Back in uh, 2007 and eight, I entered a Buddhist chaplaincy training. And I remember one of my teachers, very wonderful teacher, Judy Trimpu, Jimpu Hirsch, likened practice to the peeling of an onion. My, under, my challenge, our, under, our challenge as I understood it was to peel away layer after layer of our solid constructed identity that had formed over many years by causes and conditions. So a challenge to peel away the habits that contracted and limited me, caused dysfunction in my relationships and created suffering. So I, we peel away many endless layers to get closer in our as we practice, to get closer to the essential core of who we are Buddha nature, the large self that is love, that cares and responds in each moment with what is needed, what is called for. Trudy said, and I've never forgotten this, as you get closer to the core, the layers get tougher and harder to peel away. It strikes me now that there is a paradox in the peeling away of layers. The onion gets smaller and we get bigger. Practice is hard at times. Sometimes the pain we feel taking the back backward step is very hard. It's difficult to feel, to stay with. It's hard to hold up a lamp and look within at our own missteps, greed, anger, and ignorance. I think it takes a lot of courage and determination to practice. So there's a story that I wanna share. A while ago, I was sitting in front of my computer in a Zoom gathering. The person who was speaking was a person who is a sincere Buddhist practitioner, someone who shares the same values and beliefs with, with me. A few minutes into the talk, I noticed that I felt dislike for this person. I felt resistance to staying and listening. I wanted to push the leave button and get out of the Zoom room. Um, I was aware of my bristling body at the feel, the posture of this person. So it's not a very pretty picture. I heard my critical thoughts and judgments. I felt my mounting discomfort. I was aware of my reactive mind having a lot of thoughts and projections. Practice, right? The challenge, could I be open? Could I practice not knowing? Could I just listen and bear witness? Drop my judgments. I remember telling myself, that I didn't have to believe my reactive mind and thoughts or put stock in the accompanying uh, emotions. I told myself to take a few deep breaths. I pinched myself. A good pinch always helps bring me back into my body. We, we are instructed in practice to be present, to pay attention, to be grounded in our bodies, nothing to gain or attain, just notice thoughts and feelings when they arise. 
They're just the mind's projections. We are instructed to notice when we get lost in thoughts, to let them gently float away out of sight like clouds in the sky and to come back to the breath gently and with kindness to ourselves. So what was triggering my reaction? What in me? This was not about the speaker. It was about me and presented an opportunity for me to look within and possibly gain some insight into something that I don't allow in me, something that I repress. In psychological terms, what we were press is called the shadow, what is hidden in the unconscious. If the shadow isn't made conscious, what we don't allow will act out from our unconscious depths and possibly potentially wreak havoc, harmful words and actions. When the unconscious manifests, what is active, activated is brought into the light. There's an opportunity for insight, for change, to do something differently that opens up our relationships. This is liberation, one step at a time. If we don't locate our racial prejudices and hatreds, and the, our distorted thinking, we will act them out unconsciously. If we don't locate our biases, we will act them out. The fascist dictator, the conspiracy theorist, the proud boy will rule. The shadow when it stirs, as it did for me that evening, is an opportunity. I think of these moments stirrings as difficult gifts. I have come to groan perhaps when they arise and then welcome them. Looking within and asking my questions when I notice myself being activated, reactive, helps me to reground and soften. Questions help me to see the human common ground that I share with a person who I am othering. This person suffers as I do, loves as I do, is human and imperfect as I am, my brother, my sister. Conscious breathing, grounding myself in my body, investigating my reactivity helps me to find this other person in me. It helps to open and connect me. When we sit with our angst and stay with our feelings without making up a story, we learn to tolerate strong feelings and gain stability and maybe gain insight into what is underneath our anger, fear, a difficult emotion that we are feeling. So I'm going to read a few lines at the end of Rumi's poem, The Guest House, that I think speaks eloquently to what I've been talking about. This being human is a guest house. Every morning, a new arrival the dark thought, the shame, the malice. Meet them at the door laughing and invite them in. Be grateful for whoever comes because each has been sent as a guide from beyond. Uh, Dogen writes, in Uji, our study text, This Ango, a few lines that speak simply and directly to practice. The way-seeking mind 
arises in this moment. A way-seeking moment arises in this mind. It is the same with practice and with attaining the way. Thus, the self setting itself out in a ray sees itself. This is the understanding that the self is time. So the line that feels so clear to me here is thus the self setting itself out in a ray sees itself, sees itself. Practice and attaining the way, not my word, not to. And Dogen's, a moment of practice is a moment of enlightenment. So I'm getting low on time. So I'll just do a quick, uh, quick talk about a few words about a very simple and short uh, case in the Blue Cliff record. Yunmen's Every Adam Samadhi. A monk asked Yunmen, what is every Adam Samadhi? Men said, food in the bowl, water in the bucket. So I hear this monk's question as, teacher, what is this state of realization? Yudman said, food in the bowl, water in the bucket. Food and water, right? These are our ordinary basic requirements to sustain life. Tend to what is needed in your ordinary life. Every Adam Samadhi conjures an advanced practitioner who has developed the stability, equanimity, a fully engaged presence taking care of what arises in each moment. One who acts skillfully and with ease, who responds, acts with compassion. Fullness in the bowl, fullness in the bucket, a full and generous loving spirit. We all have challenges. There are no exceptions old age, sickness, and death. We are all at different stages in our practice. Sometimes we will act from awareness and sometimes not. Just keep going, peeling away the layers, deconstructing the self. What is in your bowl, in your bucket? So the question that I have been sitting with for months is how can I, we, as individuals, as a nation, a world, and earth heal? In this time of such stark dividedness, so much greed, anger, and ignorance, I believe that we need to cultivate nonviolent communication to be open, curious, listen and speak from our hearts. Take nonviolent communication skills into conversation with those who are different from us. What can I do to serve the conversations that need to take place? I believe that we can each of us be a healing present presence and make a difference. We need to practice, cultivate how we communicate our listening and speaking from the heart, our good will. Peel back the layers that shroud, shroud our essential nature and allow the powerful light 
of our love to shine. So I'm going to end with a poem. Uh, time being dedication. I'd like to dedicate this time being to the moment a hibernating bear wakes up in a frozen cave, stretches her arms and legs, slowly uncurling, unfurling her furry limbs, reaching to the moment his eyes open and she sees the stone wall of the cave, the protective womb that has kept them safe, low these men, many winter months and anon, to the moment of a caterpillar's dissolution in a winter chrysalis with the promise of gestation in springtime being, to the moment of fluttering wings breaking through gelatinous membrane. Now it's time, it's time to act, move into the fresh air, into the wide world. It's time to give thanks to sunlight breaking, dawn, darkness, joy, gratitude, rising. I give thanks for rivers, flowing to the ocean from time immemorial now and forever all time beings going forward into new possibilities, beginnings. Joyful, pure, eternal being, I give thanks. I give thanks. Thank you.